Well, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> I suppose you all know who I am. I'm Jeff Riggenbach, and I sometimes write and talk about drugs in addition to taking them now and then. And uh, I uh, must confess that when the folks here at the convention first uh, called me up and asked me if I would come and talk about drugs, I felt a certain depression uh, of the sort that people are sometimes said to feel after they come down from cocaine and other stimulants. In this case, the depression was uh, a product of the somewhat, uh, <clears throat> now what's the, um, somewhat pessimistic outlook that I have been inclined to take uh, over the last year or two about the whole topic of drugs, especially as it relates to uh, public policy, the prospects for reform of American drug laws. It seems to me that 1979 may have been the good old days, that uh, things peaked at about that time uh, where it comes to public interest in the issue, uh, where it comes to uh, the question of the truth getting a widespread hearing among the general public, uh, uh, a situation in which a lot of people who were capable of being regarded as respectable and responsible members of society were willing to come out publicly, even including the then President of the United States. Until Ronald Reagan became President, I never thought I would find myself publicly praising Jimmy Carter. But in return, you know, in, in retrospect, he really looks very good to me, and particularly when uh, you think about his drug policy. Here was the only President of the United States who's been willing to stand up in front of Congress and call, for example, for decriminalization of marijuana. This happened in 1978. Since that time, it seems to me it's been all downhill. This is not entirely the uh, doing of Ronald Reagan, but he has had a few things to do with it. He's beefed up the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration, brought the FBI and the certain branches of the military into uh, federal enforcement of drug laws, and has generally made very Nixonian noises about the whole subject. Uh, just uh, a couple of days ago in the uh, paper, I saw a headline which stated that he's now determined to do what he can to wreck the Jamaican economy. Uh, beyond the degree of uh, erectness that it already enjoys by uh, doing what he can to stamp out the marijuana industry there. Uh, outside of tourism, of course, there's hardly anything happening in Jamaica to uh, provide any economic vitality for the population uh, except for the cultivation of cannabis. And uh, it, it literally, without tourism and without marijuana, would be one of those uh, islands like the one that Samuel Butler uh, posited many years ago in which the people make a living by taking in each other's washing. But um, nevertheless, uh, Mr. Reagan wants to do this. But let me uh, step back several paces and sort of fill you in on my overall view of uh, the history and development of American drug policy and uh, perhaps make thereby a little clearer why I have felt so pessimistic and depressed about the prospects lately. Uh, first of all, I should say a few obvious things in case anyone is uh, unaware of, uh, of the issues uh, as I have them defined in my own mind. When people, when people say drugs in the news, when they say drugs causes crime, you see uh, headlines in the Oakland papers these days that say drug, drugs create pockets of fear, drugs invade neighborhoods, drugs do this and that. What they're talking about really are a relatively small number of substances. Most of them occur naturally in plants and are extracted from plants by chemical processes. A few are synthetics uh, created entirely in laboratories from base chemicals of one kind or another but uh, usually in imitation of naturally occurring substances. For example, LSD, one of the most notorious of the uh, dangerous drugs that we're always being warned about, is created in laboratories, but uh, is in effect a synthetic imitation of substances like mescaline and psilocybin, which occur naturally in cactuses and mushrooms, and which has a very similar effect on the user, although it doesn't last as long. Uh, most of the, most of the uh, uh, scare stories that we see in the media about drugs are really focused on a few drugs, heroin, cocaine, marijuana, LSD, and to a lesser extent PCP, and a few other drugs that you might classify in different ways. Some people would call them hallucinogenic drugs. The one time I tried PCP myself, uh, I was astonished to find that it had nothing in common at all in my own experience with uh, substances like LSD, and I don't really understand why people consider it a psychedelic, except perhaps that by calling it a psychedelic, they can help to give uh, LSD a bad name. But um, in any case, uh, these are the, this is a relatively small group of substances. Now, except for LSD and PCP, all of these uh, substances have been around for quite a long time. Heroin was first manufactured commercially and offered as a 
uh, an analgesic, really, in, in pretty much the same way that we now have aspirin uh, as an over-the-counter analgesic to take care of pain in the 1890s. And in fact, uh, you can, uh, if you look through old magazines or uh, get certain old books about the history of drugs in America, come across uh, advertisements that ran back in those days as advertising aspirin and heroin as though they were comparable products, like we have anison, aspirin, and bufferin, then you had anison, aspirin, and heroin, and you could just go buy it in the form of little tablets at your drugstore. And of course, some people, especially people who had already become interested in morphine and other derivatives of the opium poppy for recreational purposes, would take those little tablets and smash them and then snort the powder that resulted. Uh, instead of using them as recommended. What's the phrase you always hear on the uh, radio commercials? Uh, use only as um, uh, use only as directed, exactly. But people, you know, people like me will always exceed the recommended dosage and use the drugs in some way that they haven't been directed to do. And uh, this was happening uh, with heroin back then. Uh, the cocaine is derived from the uh, coca plant, which is a little shrub that grows in the Andes around uh, the equator in South America. Um, and is extracted by chemical process in a laboratory and ultimately uh, comes in the form of a white powder which uh, people can smoke or uh, mix in a solution and shoot up or snort. And uh, this drug has been around in the form of the, the uh, plant itself for thousands of years. The Indians in the Andes have been chewing coca leaves uh, in pretty much the way that most Americans drink coffee. That is, they get up in the morning and they start chewing coca leaves, and they do off and on all day long. Uh, I've never chewed coca leaves, but uh, the literature tells me that what you get is the same sort of stimulant effect that you get from coffee. It's not so powerful that you would describe yourself as feeling high, but you're stimulated. You have more energy, you feel more wide awake. Now, uh, in the 1860s, the drug was first uh, extracted and purified. What uh, The coca leaves, of course, contain a good deal more than just cocaine. Cocaine is merely one of the alkaloids in the leaves. And uh, scientists were first able to isolate it and uh, produce it all by itself in the 1860s. Within a, about uh, two decades, it had become a very popular substance in Europe and to a lesser extent in the United States. But the United States caught up. Uh, it was uh, especially popular as an ingredient in wines and soft drinks. Uh, a lot of people know or partially know the story of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola was originally a soft drink made with cocaine, which had been extracted from uh, coca leaves. And uh, they used other uh, things that were in the coca leaves to flavor the beverage, and they used the cocaine to give it an upper effect on the drinker. And uh, this was a very popular beverage back in that time. There were others as well. Uh, and uh, you could also buy cocaine in drugstores, just a, a box of 100% pure cocaine, which was advertised as an asthma remedy, for example. If you have trouble breathing, you know, inhale some of this and you won't have any trouble. Uh, many of these dangerous drugs, I mentioned before that heroin was sold as an analgesic. Other opium products were sold during this period also as what they called patent medicines in drugstores without prescriptions, and they were offered as cures for all sorts of things that, of course, they can't cure. By and large, these drugs are not useful uh, medically as cures for anything. They're useful sometimes as anesthetics. Cocaine is an outstanding local anesthetic. It really created enormous medical breakthroughs when it was first discovered because it was found, for example, that it can be used on the eye. Certain kinds of eye operations previous to the discovery of cocaine had simply had to be performed without anesthetic. Uh, you couldn't give a person the general anesthetic because then the eyeball would roll up. He would lo lose consciousness and you would lose the ability to have the patient control the movement of his eye for you while you were digging into it. On the other hand, you can imagine that would be a rather unpleasant experience for the patient without some sort of an anesthetic, but they couldn't put any local anesthetic on the tissue of the eye without destroying it or damaging it in a serious way. Cocaine. The discovery of cocaine made all sorts of things immediately possible. So many of these drugs have legitimate medical uses beyond simply having fun with them, but they aren't the sorts of drugs that can cure diseases in the way that, let us say, penicillin or other antibiotics can do. They were offered as cures by the uh, patent medicine companies, and what, of course, they did is people had various diseases and they bought these drugs and they took them and they felt better. And that was, you know, enough for them. They didn't cure the disease, but it did make them feel better. They didn't mind being sick anymore. Now, uh, marijuana has, uh, is really just a weed. It's, uh, the, the proper name of the plant is cannabis sativa, or in English, hemp. And it has grown all over the world for as long as anybody knows. It is one of the first plants that was ever identified by uh, uh, whatever those people call themselves who identify plants and give them scientific names. Um, the uh, 
uh, plant has been used as a drug for literally thousands of years. It's been traced back 2,500 years to China, about 2,000 years in India, and has grown everywhere in the world and been used everywhere in the world. There's some indication, though it's difficult to interpret the data, that American Indians may have made limited use of it as an intoxicant even before Europeans came here. It is certain that a variety of the plant was already growing in this hemisphere. It just seems to have spontaneously grown everywhere. And people who have tried to plant it know that it will grow anywhere. It's one of its characteristics that makes it different from the opium poppy from the coca plant, you can plant marijuana anywhere on earth, no matter what the circumstances of climate are, and it will grow. Of course, it grows better some places than it does others, but you can get an effective plant anywhere. The plant is extremely useful for all sorts of things. The fiber was used for centuries commercially to make paper, to make cloth, to make rope, and this is the, uh, the origin of the concept of hemp rope. This is made out of the, the fiber inside the stalk of the marijuana plant. The plant has been used medicinally for a long time. During the 19th century, there were a number of medical papers written on its use as an analgesic. Uh, it's especially uh, useful as a uh, specific against nausea. It has uh, just recently been rediscovered by the medical establishment in this connection, of course. Uh, people suffering from uh, nausea as a result of chemotherapy, cancer patients, have begun, uh, you have, have discovered that if you smoke a joint, the nausea goes away. It's more effective against nausea than any other known drug, and it has been this way for 150 years. Now, <clears throat> these drugs, I, I go through all of this history by way of saying these drugs are not unfamiliar, except for LSD and PCP, which were invented in the 1940s and 50s, respectively. LSD was invented more or less by mistake. A uh, drug researcher at Sandoz in Switzerland was doing some uh, experiments with the consequences of combining various items, and he came up with a, uh, a combination which he described as lysergic acid diethylamide uh, number 25, and he took what he thought was a minuscule dose of it to see what would happen. And the thing with LSD is it's an enormously powerful drug. You take micrograms of it in, in, instead of milligrams, which you would take of any other kind of drug that people know, so that the drug, the dose that um, Mr. Hoffman took was in fact not a minuscule dose, but an enormous dose, and he, uh, took, he got on his bicycle and rode home, and apparently had a very interesting trip uh, in more ways than one. This was in the 40s, and for a period of 10 or 15 years after that, the drug uh, rapidly became very interesting to psychiatrists especially, and was used in a lot of uh, hospital experiments and a lot of prison experiments with volunteers, not uh, forced on the prisoners. Psychiatrists were interested in it because it has profound, uh, a profound effect on one's thinking and uh, one's memory. And uh, then, of course, in the 60s, it became popular with young people and was uh, made illegal, and uh, all medical use of it has since stopped. PCP was discovered, was uh, developed originally in the late 1950s and early 60s as an animal tranquilizer. People were looking for a drug which would be uh, capable of being used on very large and uh, potentially uh, da dangerous animals like elephants and horses when you had to do something like pull their teeth or something like this that they might object to. You wanted to have something that would calm them and make them uh, easy to deal with. So they developed uh, PCP, phencyclidine. Uh, it has since become popular in some elements as a recreational drug. It doesn't, however, have the effect of making people easy to manage. Um, now. The drugs uh, that were derived from the opium poppy, including heroin, uh, cocaine, and um, marijuana, were not illegal until very recently. Uh, the uh, drugs against the uh, opium uh, products originated here in the Bay Area in San Francisco a little over 100 years ago. And they were in the form of laws against opium smoking, specifically. Now, at that time, opium was used in a lot of different ways. Morphine existed, and people uh, used that you know, uh, intravenously. Uh, they uh, drank uh, a concoction uh, using alcohol in combination with morphine, uh, which was known as laudanum, and which was a popular drug, especially among the middle classes in the 19th century. It was generally uh, believed by doctors, and quite rightly during that period, that if you had the choice of being an, a morphine addict or an alcoholic, it would be much better for your health to be a morphine addict. And uh, doctors generally took the approach of taking people who drank too much and, and trying to switch them to morphine instead, because it was considered less debilitating than booze. Uh, cocaine was, uh, as I say, widely used in patent medicines and in soft drinks. Marijuana was not widely used in this country except in states which had uh, large Mexican or Latin American populations, whose Mexicans especially and other Latin Americans had been using it for at least 100 years up to the uh, beginning of the 
20th century and had brought the habit with them into the southwestern United States, places like California, Colorado, and Texas, where they were uh, coming into, uh, in, in the form of migrant laborers beginning around the 1890s of the first large waves of Mexican immigration. Now, the first uh, opium laws, as I say, originated here in San Francisco, and the thing that's significant about them is that they were only laws against opium smoking and importation of opium for the use of smokers. And the thing that's interesting about this is that the only people who used opium that way were the immigrant Chinese. The uh, immigrant Chinese had come in large numbers to California in uh, large measure to work on the Intercontinental Railroad on this end and to do other labor, and then they had stayed here, and uh, during the ensuing a uh, series of recessions and depressions that uh, took place over the years. Uh, they became periodically very unpopular with the populace. There was already a certain amount of generalized racial resentment against them, xenophobia. These are foreigners. They have uh, filthy un-American habits and they should go back where they came from. But this always intensified during periods of high unemployment when the economy was not doing well because it was felt that the, Chine the Chinese were taking people's jobs. And therefore, uh, there was a, a lot of uh, popular feeling against them. And uh, it was during a period of this kind that the opium laws were first passed. To jump ahead a little bit in my story, it was during the uh, 1930s that the first big push uh, against marijuana began, not only uh, in the federal uh, government, uh, the Marijuana Tax Act, the original anti-marijuana law, of the federal government was passed in 1937, but it was also during the 30s that most of the American states began outlawing marijuana. The original marijuana laws, uh, the first ones ever to be passed, are less than 100 years old. They date back to about 1909, and they originated here in California and in Colorado. And uh, there's a lot of uh, material available from that period that ties it with uh, hatred of the Mexicans and the Latin Americans. Uh, I, have, I wrote an article uh, quite extensive on marijuana some years ago in Libertarian Review, which I'm going to steal a little information out of here to give you an example of the sort of thing I'm talking about. Uh, during the 30s, when the Depression hit, you had a similar situation nationwide to the one that I described a moment ago on the West Coast with the Chinese. People were out of work, there was a shortage of jobs, and here in uh, the Southwest, uh, and in the West, where there were large pockets of Latin Americans living, people had the idea, why don't these people go back home where they came from instead of staying here taking jobs away from Native Americans? And uh, as I uh, wrote here in the uh, Libertarian uh, Review article, uh, there was one group called the American Coalition, which during this period advocated strict bars on Latin American immigration so that mixture with a, quote, inferior race, close quote, would not lead the white majority down the road to, quote, a race suicide, close quote. This group was among the loudest and most enthusiastic of the handful of genuinely influential organizations which favored national marijuana prohibition in the 1930s. Uh, an American coalition spokesman told the New York Times in 1935 that, quote, marijuana, perhaps now the most insidious of our narcotics, is a direct byproduct of unrestri unrestricted Mexican immigration, close quote. Uh, Harry Anslinger, who was a former prohibition agent who was then out of work because uh, prohibition had been ended in the early 30s, and a lot of people think he was looking for something else to occupy his time, uh, took it upon himself to make a big national push in favor of a federal anti-marijuana law at this uh, point. And uh, Anslinger went before uh, Congress in 1937 to testify on the need for prohibition of the weed and submitted, among other things, in evidence, a letter from the uh, civic-minded editor of the Daily Courier in, Al in Alamosa, Colorado, a city which had lately been on the receiving end of a good deal of unrestricted Mexican immigration. The editor solicited federal assistance and local efforts to stamp out marijuana abuse, which, he said, had become so menacing that it beggared his powers of description. Quote, I wish I could show you what a small marijuana cigarette can do to one of our degenerate Spanish speaking residents. That's why our problem is so great. The greatest percentage of our population is composed of Spanish speaking persons, most of whom are low mentally because of social and racial conditions." Close quote. Uh, Harry Anslinger, we know, was pretty much in sympathy with this kind of talk. He had uh, written a magazine article a few years before as part of his anti-marijuana campaign and had uh, described dope smugglers, quote, vessels sailing from filthy Central American and West Indian ports having the lowest scum of the earth as members of the crew, and about how these crew members came ashore in this country bringing dangerous drugs and contaminating the people of the shores with whom they mingle with contagious and loathsome disease. Uh, now, this sort of uh, talk was also present uh, during the early years of the 20th century when cocaine first began to be outlawed. Cocaine was primarily used by black people in the South. 
up until the 1920s. The uh, way that that came about, by the way, is that after uh, the Civil War, a lot of the old plantations, of course, went on existing, although the black people were no longer slaves, they were sharecroppers, and uh, they still went out onto, the, into, onto huge expanses of land under white supervisors and did work in these fields. And the white supervisors, cocaine having become very popular in Europe during this period, became aware of its properties. Among its properties are it stimulates, gives you uh, more energy, it gives you uh, more mental alertness, and it kills your appetite. This means that people can work 12 hours a day and not have to eat and not mind it. And, well, I mean, that's obviously a benefit if you're looking at it from the point of view of the, uh, you know, a former slave driving boss on a southern plantation who now has a bunch of uh, uh, uppity uh, sharecroppers working for him. And uh, so the uh, southern uh, farmers were importing cocaine in large quantities and giving it out free to the black people. And the black people, of course, liked it, and they kept on using it after many of them had moved into the southern cities. So it was in New Orleans that the original cocaine laws came about. And you uh, can read uh, astounding stories. I should have brought some of this stuff with me. Uh, appeared in newspapers in the New York Times during this period about uh, crazed black men who had uh, taken cocaine and raped white women, and uh, the police had shot them directly in the chest with seven bullets, and they were still coming and had to be subdued by eight men and all the, all the sorts of things that you now hear about PCP. Uh, were, uh, but it was only black people, uh, you understand, that were crazed by this uh, use of cocaine in this way. So there was a definite a racial and ethnic tone to much of the original legislation against these drugs. And I suggest personally that we can place that sort of an interpretation also on the campaign against LSD in the 60s. Because although LSD was not the favorite drug of an ethnic minority, it was the favorite drug of what you might call a social minority. Here we had uh, a large collection of young people all over the country, uh, you know, cutting their hair the way they wanted to instead of the way the uh, older generation wanted them to, uh, exp openly expressing their contempt for authority and for the leadership of the older generation, their parents' generation, the people in the government, and uh, leading lifestyles that were regarded as degenerate. And uh, they became apostles of LSD use, and it seems to me it just fits right in to the general picture. Uh, the government's reaction to uh, LSD during the 60s seems to me to be exactly the same sort of thing as governmental reactions to uh, earlier drugs when they were uh, the uh, favored habits of despised ethnic minorities instead of the favored habit of a despised social minority. Uh, but of course, people who advocate drug laws today don't say, well, we want to you know, keep these drugs uh, illegal because we don't want these uh, uppity uh, ethnic minorities doing anything they want to. This has never been the explicit uh, rationale for the drug laws, although it was much more explicit in the testimony and writings uh, early in the century of the people who favored these laws, because in those days, people weren't so sensitive about this. And uh, it was not socially unacceptable to be bigoted. Today. Of course, the justification for the laws is uh, offered along different lines. It basically boils down to two propositions. Uh, first of all, drugs destroy the user, and second, drugs cause crime, thereby destroying or undermining society. Uh, the uh, first part, drugs destroy the user, is generally uh, has at least two subheads under it. One is they destroy the mind and or health of the user and render the user incapable of living his life in a satisfactory manner. And uh, second, as a result of this, they render him unproductive at work so that he has high absenteeism, high rate of accidents on the job, he cheats his employer, and uh, reduces the productivity of the American economy, fails to support his family, and uh, generally creates misery for all those around him. This is funny. <laughs> Um, well, yes, actually, it is funny, except that it's so ridiculous. Um, the fact, of course, is that I don't know. The, the, the word that I, I use, generally use in uh, reacting to this uh, sort of proposition is lies. There is a grain of truth in the kinds of claims that I've just outlined, but it is so small by comparison with the rest of what is mixed in. Uh, that uh, it's very difficult to understand how anyone who has looked into the question at all can take this kind of proposition seriously. Uh, marijuana, for example, I'm perfectly prepared to say, and most medical people uh, who are not in the pay of the government, who are not Dr. Gabriel Nehas or another one of these professional drug abuse mongers, 
uh, will uh, acknowledge is one of the least toxic substances known to medical science. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent over a period of at least 100 years, starting dating back to the Indian Hemp Drugs Commission report of the British studying drug abuse in India in the 1880s all the way to the, to the present time. Millions and millions of dollars have been spent, hundreds of years, and the devotion of people uh, to forming commissions and conducting inquiries trying to show that marijuana is harmful in some way to the people who use it. No one has ever succeeded. No one has ever been able to come up with any evidence that even people who smoke marijuana daily in enormous quantities from childhood through the rest of their lives suffer any damage of any kind from smoking marijuana. Yes. There have been studies that have suggested that and that have also suggested that the sperm count of men who are heavy users of marijuana is reduced, which is, of course, would seem an obviously related or possibly related phenomenon. Uh, there are two, two observations to be made about this, one general, one personal. Uh, in general, it, is not, it has not always been possible for other researchers to duplicate these findings. This has been the case with so many of the kinds of tests. For example, there are tests that show that LSD causes increased multiplication of certain kinds of chromosomes. Well, A, you can't, not every test shows this. It doesn't always turn up. And B, which leads to questions about whether the LSD is really the cause or not, of course. And then B, no one knows for sure what difference that makes. That is, chromosomes split anyway, and it's not clear what consequence there is if they split faster under certain circumstances or for temporary periods of time. Uh, in the case of the marijuana, as I say, uh, subsequent follow-up studies have not been able to confirm this kind of result. In my particular case, I was curious about this because back in the 70s, I was thinking, you know, gee, that would be an advantage. I mean, I could see how somebody might think it was a bad thing to have your sperm count lowered, but I thought, you know, it's just like this could be a, a fun sort of birth control. You know, if you smoke enough dope, then you don't have to worry about getting your girlfriend pregnant. So I went with my girlfriend to her gynecologist, and uh, he was a cool guy, and I said, uh, I've been reading some of these studies. Uh, I smoke marijuana every day. Uh, do you think it's possible I might have a reduced sperm count and that this, uh, that this might be relevant to our desire not to have children? And um, he said, well, let me take a sample and I'll get it analyzed for you and see. So he did, and he uh, reported back that I had an alarmingly low sperm count and that uh, it would, there was almost no chance that uh, I would be able to father a child. And within a very short time, my girlfriend, who had in the meantime become my wife, became pregnant. Um, and the uh, child uh, that resulted is now six years old. Uh, anyway, that's what I have to say about that, yes. <laughs> Lung cancer? You can state as a general proposition that inhaling hot smoke from any burning substance, including trash fires or you know, the grass that you cut in your backyard, is probably not the best thing for your lungs. Different people react differently to this kind of thing. I mean, we've all heard of stories of people who smoke three packs a day of cigarettes for you know, all their lives and die in their sleep at the age of 105 and don't ever get lung cancer, whereas other people do get it at the age of 28. There are different sensitivities to this. Some people can inhale a lot of smoke and not suffer any overt consequences or get diseases, and other people do get diseases when they do this. Uh, no tests have uh, shown that the smoke and the tars from marijuana are any more harmful than the smoke and tars from any other smoke that people customarily inhale, except one study down at UCLA which suggested that if people smoked the same amount of marijuana daily that heavy cigarette smokers smoke, and we're talking here about two to three packs a day, that this would be more harmful now, as again, we're in the category of studies where it's not clear what the causes of some of the results were, and some of these studies are so sloppy. I mean, you start reading them and you find that, that a certain percentage of the uh, people in the study were also cigarette smokers, and no effort was made to weed them out beforehand. So how, how can you even tell whether lung damage in particular cases was due to tobacco smoking or marijuana smoking? I mean, procedural errors of this kind that are so gross that you would think that anyone who wanted to call himself a medical scientist could not possibly be guilty of such an error except deliberately because he wanted to load the evidence. This is the kind of thing that you run into when you get past newspaper reports and get copies of the studies from the labs that do them and read the things. Um, 
and of course, the other thing is nobody smokes that much marijuana. I don't know whether it would be possible. The Rastafarians uh, in Jamaica smoke it all day long and in huge quantities, and I have seen the assertion that they smoke an ounce a day and things like this. Now, an ounce a day, an ounce of marijuana is about what you get, you know, a pack of cigarettes weighs about an ounce. So you, if I don't, personally, I cannot imagine smoking an ounce a day. I don't know how you could take it all out and how you could burn it all up, unless you, you know, set up a huge bonfire and inhaled through a giant tube of some kind, it would just, it would be, you know, would be defeated by the sheer magnitude of the task. And to do two or three of them is really amazing. Uh, so even if the UCLA study uh, is accurate in the sense that the same quantity of burned marijuana produces more harmful tars than the, uh, the same quantity of, uh, of tobacco, um, the fact of the matter is that nobody smokes that much. Even the most confirmed potheads uh, don't smoke that kind of quantity. Yes. Uh, marijuana is accused uh, in the literature a lot of uh, hurting short-term memory. Uh, you hear a lot about short-term memory loss from getting smoking. I think, uh, from my personal experience, that may be true, especially while you're stoned. It is sometimes difficult to remember things that happened just a few minutes ago and much easier to remember things that happened yesterday or a week ago. But this seems to pass with the intoxication uh, and uh, is therefore not you know, a long-term or permanent uh, effect of the drug. I really consider marijuana absolutely harmless. I don't know of another substance, including foods, that I think is as benign to human beings as marijuana is. Now these other drugs, there may be more to be said. I'm inclined to think that LSD is pretty close to harmless too, uh, mainly because uh, although the, the research has not gone on for nearly as long and not nearly the resources have been put into the research yet, but it's been very difficult for them to come up with any evidence of anything except that people can, it's very powerful. It's, I mean, if you've ever been really drunk on enormously powerful liquor by drinking, you know, uh, Everclear grain alcohol and chug-a-lugging a couple of shots of it or something so that you get drunk really fast, it is even more powerful than that. If you're not used to it, it is ex can be extremely disorienting. And it is possible for people to do dumb things. And it is uh, therefore believable that people jump out of windows and so forth if they do not know what they're getting into, or they take too large a dose, or they freak out and become hysterical when they start experiencing the changes. But in terms of its physiological effect on the body of the user, nobody's ever been able to show that there are any harmful consequences from using it. Cocaine and, hair and uh, the opiates are not as if there are degrees of harmlessness, it's not ad, they're not as harmless as these other substances, but they are not as harmless as nicotine, and they are not as harmless as alcohol. All doctors know this. In harmful, I'm sorry. It is, uh, thank you. <laughs> it, is, uh, it, is, uh, all, it is very difficult, uh, even in these days of uh, enormously increased uh, enthusiasm for uh, the drug abuse myth uh, in the public uh, prints, to find reputable medical people who will claim otherwise because the more people who have looked into this, uh, the more clear it has become. Uh, most of the uh, health problems associated with the use of heroin and the other opiates have pretty well been proved to be, in fact, the health problems caused by the laws against these drugs. This is in two ways. First of all, the laws drive the price up enormously. Uh, I'm not real conversant with the exact data on heroin, uh, but I can give you an example with cocaine, which is in the same general ballpark in terms of its price. You can buy an ounce of pure cocaine if you are a physician with a narcotics license, you're an eye, ear, and nose, and throat specialist, or one of the couple of other kinds of doctors who still occasionally use cocaine in certain limited medical uses. You can buy a jar of it, 100% pure, for about $50 from Merck or Lilly, the two American manufacturers of cocaine. Now, if I go out tonight and buy an ounce of cocaine from somebody that I know in the East Bay, this man is going to sell it to me for at least $1,800, probably closer to $2,000, and it will not be pure. And I won't know what else is in it. 
or what percentage of that stuff that is before me, this white powder here, is not cocaine but something else. Uh, the, uh, I do know a lot about what kinds of things are commonly used to cut street cocaine, but unless I have a little lab kit and I want to go to some trouble to analyze what is in any particular sample, I don't know what I'm getting. With junkies, apparently the situation is even worse in terms of their not being able to tell what to expect. They also have to deal with the problem of the black market supplying them with synthetic heroin substitutes. Uh, a friend of mine named Jack Schaefer, who was for a number of years an editor of Inquiry uh, and is now a freelance writer, has an, uh, an article in, I think it's the March issue, the current issue of Science 85 on what he calls designer drugs, which is uh, the trend toward uh, laboratory manufacture of various substances which are mostly re intended to resemble heroin physically and, and in the effects on the user, but are much cheaper to produce. And uh, these things have all sorts of undesirable consequences. I mean, not all of them have the same consequences. One particular blend that some chemist cooked up down in San Jose, which Jack refers to in his article, has given a certain number of its users, uh, it, it seems to have brought on a sort of uh, premature Parkinson's disease, so that you have you know, these 28-year-old junkies going around with the uh, shaking and, so, and the other symptoms that characterize uh, Parkinson's, which usually strikes people who are quite old. And um, so these, by and large, the health problems associated with heroin use are associated with the adulterants that are introduced into the drug, the fact that the users cannot get a drug which is pure, and second, by the fact that the drug that they buy is so outrageously highly priced, and they are so devoted to it, that they don't uh, invest their money in proper nutrition or in proper medical care. They skip meals. They don't bother about keeping their surroundings clean. They don't bother about, uh, they, they are place in a situation by the law in which they can't even take care to be uh, properly clean with things like needles and are sometimes placed in a position of having to share them with other users because, of course, these needles are also unavailable except by prescription. You can't just go out and buy one. Uh, so that uh, the health problems are, in effect, caused by the laws. This has been verified further by um, studies that have been done in hospitals, Columbia University in the 30s, there were uh, a couple of uh, specific uh, tests that were very impressive that are mentioned and written up in this book, Illicit and Illicit Drugs by Edward Brecker, in which uh, volunteer heroin addicts were given pure heroin in, the, in a hospital environment and it was made sure that they weren't taking in other uh, substances other than you know food and so forth while they were in the hospital. And it was found, two things were found, one is that the consequences for their health turned out to be, I mean, all the, all the health consequences that they had been having as junkies suddenly disappeared once they were getting a pure supply, which was free, which they didn't have to shell out hundreds of dollars a day for. And second, they found with volunteers that they could not come up with a dose so large that it would kill anybody. This is an interesting phenomenon, which Brecker devotes a lot of uh, space to in his book, that uh, the heroin overdose, there is some evidence that there may literally be no such thing that the cases in which uh, it has been looked into how do junkie experienced junkies react to enormously larger doses of heroin than they're used to, they just react by getting high and falling asleep. They don't die. But they do die when there are adulterants in their heroin or when they take the heroin in addition to taking downers, or uh, which is to say, uh, especially, um, I've lost the term for the uh, uh, barbiturates, exactly, or with booze. If you start, if you think for a moment, I'll come to you, uh, about a lot of the rock stars, for example, Janis Joplin, uh, Jimi Hendrix, who died supposedly of heroin overdoses, even if you just read the stupid press reports, the press will believe anything the DEA tells them. Uh, this, I will just go off on this for a moment because it's a, a thing of mine. In the 60s, you know, the uh, news media became uh, partisan, we're told. The news media became critical of government and uh, it has since been critical of government and it has been arrayed against the government. This is so preposterous. The only thing that happened in the 60s is that a lot of reporters uh, realized that the White House might have a motive for lying sometimes. It might be worthwhile to to think about what they said and, and question it. Might this not be true? Might there be any uh, hidden agenda here? And they found that this was also true for the Pentagon. But they never found that it was true for any other branch of the government. And if you suggest to most editors or most reporters today that the Drug Enforcement Administration might lie, they're absolutely astonished. Why would they lie? What motive would they have? A survey was done uh, of radio and television stations not long ago to find out the news directors and the public service directors and people in these stations, what kinds of topics would you like most to have public service announcements on? You know what one, with 80 some odd percent of all responding stations choosing it, 
spots on drug abuse. It's not, there's not even any question of is there such a thing as drug abuse? Are the drugs really harmful? Are the laws harmful? It's just, it's just a foregone conclusion. Drug abuse is a terrible thing. It will harm society and we, it is a public service for us to speak out against it. This is the attitude that you get in the media. But even if you read the media accounts alone of deaths like those of Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix, you find that they were drinking in addition to shooting up heroin. There's a lot of evidence that suggests that, there isn't, that heroin not only does not harm anybody's health, but it, you can't kill anybody under normal circumstances either unless they mix it with other drugs or unless they take in along with the huge quantity of heroin a huge quantity of some adulterate such as quinine which can have unfortunate effects on you if you inject a bunch of it into your bloodstream. I think you had a question. Uh, I haven't read enough about that aside from the press reports, which I feel skeptical about. Um, there is a, you can kill yourself with a, with a large enough dose of cocaine. I don't know how large a dose of cocaine he, it is alleged that Belushi was given. He was supposed to have been given the speed balls repeatedly, which are mixtures of cocaine and heroin. Uh, it is possible to overdose on cocaine. It, it's, it'll stop the heart if you take enough in. It is a case in which, under normal circumstances, if you're not shooting it up, most users of cocaine snort cocaine. And under these circumstances, there's almost no danger. I mean, technically, it is theoretically possible to kill yourself with an overdose of marijuana, too. I found when I was doing some research on marijuana a number of years ago, but what you would have to do is take in, somehow, all at once, within a period of a minute or two, the equivalent of a pound of marijuana. Now, <laughs> There might be a way to do this by reducing the pound, you know, to oil or something like that, but you couldn't drink it because then it would have to go through the digestive process and it wouldn't all enter the bloodstream at once. You would have to find a way to smoke all that all at once or inject it or in some other way so that it would enter the bloodstream. And so you see it's a big problem. It might be solvable, but you'd have to be determined. You'd have to want to. It's like... It's somewhat like the problem of drinking yourself to death. You can drink yourself to death, but usually people who do it are committing suicide because there's not really a danger from sitting here drinking beer that you'll drink yourself to death. In order to drink yourself to death, you have to set out with a fifth of scotch or something and deliberately chug a lug it or something, deliberately take in an enormous amount all at once. Yes? Okay. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, I will eventually. I'm uh, running much longer than I intended to originally with this part of the stuff, but I am certainly coming to that ultimately. Uh, let me just uh, quickly wrap up here and say the drugs are not. Uh, the cocaine and heroin are probably more dangerous than the other, the other popular psychoactive drugs, but they aren't as dangerous as booze. They aren't as dangerous as nicotine. Neither of them has been shown to cause serious diseases. Uh, neither of them in, used in a normal fashion uh, if they were available on a free market at a r rational price in a condition of purity of the kind that we normally associate with cigarettes and uh, beer and things of that sort that we buy, uh, would, uh, be, they would be much more benign substances than the legal drugs that we have in our midst. Uh, I should uh, briefly throw in one other example, which I just love, because uh, many people smoke tobacco, especially cigarettes. Uh, a lot of people don't know that uh, very recently, in the 20s, say about the time Ronald Reagan was 12 years old, m marijuana was actually legal in more states than cigarettes were. Uh, in this country. Within another 15 years, the situation had reversed and cigarettes were universally legal and marijuana was illegal. But cigarettes were once widely illegal. Prominent Americans, Thomas Edison is an example, once stated publicly that uh, he believed that cigarette smoking caused irreversible brain damage and would not hire anyone to work for him who smoked cigarettes. Uh, but we don't think of cigarettes in this sort of way today, nor do we think of cigarettes as destroying the health except in the long term through uh, lung cancer and related diseases. But during, at the end of World War II, during the occupation of Berlin, cigarettes were rationed. As a, I mean, it was one of many things that were rationed, and this is a small sidelight, uh, but 
Uh, I want to read you a paragraph or two from Edward Brecker's Licit and Illicit Drugs on this because it indirectly illustrates a point about these health effects. Um, following World War II, well, he, he starts out by saying, when the supply of cigarettes is curtailed, cigarette smokers behave remarkably like heroin addicts. Following World War II, for example, the tobacco ration in Germany was cut to two packs per month for men and one pack per month for women. I don't know why the sexism in that case, but whatever. Uh, Dr. F. I. Arntzen of the Research Center for uh, Psychodiagnosis in Münster, Germany, questioned hundreds of Germans during the cigarette famine and reported his findings in the American Journal of Psychology in 1948. Up to a point, Dr. Arntzen noted, the majority of the habitual smokers preferred to do without food, even under extreme conditions of nutrition, rather than to forego tobacco. Thus, when food rations in prisoner of war camps were down to 900 to 1,000 calories, smokers were still willing to barter their food rations for tobacco. Of 300 German civilians questioned, 256 had obtained tobacco at the black market, 37 had bought tobacco and food, and only five had bought food but no tobacco. Many housewives who were smokers battered fat and bartered fat and sugar for cigarettes. In disregard of considerations of personal dignity, conventional decorum, and aesthetic hygienic feelings, cigarette butts were picked up out of the street dirt by people who on their own statements would in any other circumstances have felt disgust at such contact. Smokers also condescended to beg for tobacco, but not for other things. In reports on subjective impressions, 80% of those questioned declared that it felt worse to do without nicotine than without alcohol. Uh, he goes on in uh, subsequent uh, paragraphs to uh, indicate that uh, there was also a certain amount uh, oh, yes, here it is. Re reports of women willing to prostitute themselves for a carton of cigarettes and uh, men who trade stolen goods for cigarettes were also common after the war. And this, in, in effect, they started doing all the same things that junkies do, and yet we don't see this around us now. It seems to me that the obvious conclusion is that it's not the drugs that cause this behavior, it's the laws against the drugs and the indirect consequences of same. Uh, the related question of how can people function, it is always asserted, you know, if you take these drugs then you can't do what you have to do and uh, so you become unproductive and you have absenteeism at work and all the rest of this stuff. Uh, Thomas Zaz, in a wonderful paragraph in his book, Heresies, has said what it seems to me is the bottom line on this, so let me read you this paragraph. Ostensibly, the use of illicit drugs like marijuana and heroin is prohibited because they're said to impair the social functioning of the person who uses them. This claim is inconsistent with the fact that the authorities concerned, mainly parents, politicians, and physicians, usually don't know who uses such drugs, and that they support costly efforts to develop and deploy tests to detect illicit drug users. Many such tests, moreover, are carried out without the subject's knowledge of being tested or without his consent to it. If illicit drugs impair social functioning, a contingency which is clearly absurd without specifying drugs and dosages, then we need no special tests to identify the users. And if they do not necessarily impair social functioning, which is clearly the case, then testing people for drug abuse by examining their urines is unlike testing them for diabetes, and is instead more like testing men for Jewishness by examining their penises. Think about this when you read in the, you, know, you pick up the sports pages these days, the sports pages are the drug pages. All the teams are giving uh, <laughs> tests to their athletes, you know, to find out if they're uh, taking drugs. Why don't they know? There was one celebrated case a few years ago of a National Basketball Association star who said, who, you know, had done fabulously well, I think with the Kansas City Kings or the, is that right? I'm not up on basketball enough, who, who said, uh, you know, uh, he was high on cocaine during all these games, and he played one game on LSD. Uh, there was a uh, pitcher at the San Diego Padres who pitched a game on LSD, and nobody thought there was anything wrong with the game until later when they found out that he pitched it on LSD. Uh, there have been all sorts of prominent people uh, over the years who have been lifelong drug addicts and have gone on functioning uh, anyway. William Halstead is probably the most celebrated example. American surgeon in the 19th century who uh, developed a lot of breakthroughs in surgery and helped to found the Johns Hopkins University Medical School and was found at the time of his death to have been a morphine addict for the entire time of his career and presumably was performing his operations under the uh, influence of what today we would call smack. But this did not somehow make it impossible for him to function properly. Or taking uh, uh, cocaine or heroin or whatever it may be, 
and for the first time in their life, they feel good. They feel, they, they, where's that nagging uh, feeling that I've always had? Uh, they, are, they are now functioning properly. Do you, do you know anything about that? I have, uh, I've run into uh, assertions of that type uh, just here and there without any uh, quantitative backup. Uh, Zaz makes the comment somewhere that basically so that some people do take drugs in order to cope, that quite the contrary, that just as you say, that their purpose in taking drugs is that it makes it easier for them to assume their responsibilities and do what they need to do rather than uh, harder. And that, so there are really two types of drug users, those who use them in order to cope and those who use them to dramatize and flagrantly symbolize the fact that they refuse to do what people expect of them and what uh, society expects of them. Um, now, uh, the uh, related claim that drug use causes crime can be dispensed with pretty clearly, I think. I don't, nobody claims anymore that marijuana users uh, commit crime. Uh, yeah, and in the case of marijuana and the opiates, heroin, by and large, the effect of the drug is such as to mitigate against crime. I mean, when a lot of people, when they drink, get violent and go out and pick fights. But when people smoke marijuana or shoot up heroin, they tend to get laid back, you know, and relaxed, and uh, they tend to go to sleep. Uh, it's not the sort of thing that is likely to make you go out and uh, commit violent crimes against your neighbors. A uh, stimulant, like cocaine, might theoretically do that, but in fact, it's been very difficult for anybody to adduce any evidence that people take cocaine and are by the cocaine, rather than by their previously made plans, induced to go out and commit crimes. Uh, most studies uh, suggest that the reason so many criminals use crimes is because they're in the criminal world and the, and the, I mean, I'm sorry, so many criminals use drugs is because they are living in the criminal subculture in the criminal world and the drugs are easily available around them and they know people who are selling them and uh, that they were criminals before they began using drugs rather than that they became criminals after using drugs. Uh, again, a lot of property crime is committed especially by junkies to get junk and the reason is because the, the price is driven up astronomically by the laws. Uh, there was a, a controlled study uh, taken in Detroit some years ago in which the police tested this by selecting areas of the community and alternately enforcing the drug laws harshly and just ignoring them and letting it go on. And what they found is that when they ignored the drug uh, trade and did not try to enforce the laws, the prices slowly fell and the property crime fell at the same time. And the more harshly they enforced the laws, the higher the prices went and the more property crime was created. We don't think of, I mean, do you see people out in the uh, street uh, committing property crimes to buy cigarettes? Or prostituting themselves to buy cigarettes as they were doing in, in Berlin after World War II? No, because they don't have to pay outrageous prices for cigarettes. I mean, by comparison to what I used to have to pay for them back in the 1960s, they seem pretty outrageous, but by comparison to the black market drugs, they're absurdly low. Another, okay, another new electronic mind, that is a physiologist, he strongly contends that, that the drug traffic in the U.S. is controlled by the CIA, uh, and they use the proceeds, uh, they, 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 want, they want it to be illegal because it's you know, so profitable, and they use the proceeds to finance uh, corporate operations that they can't get Sure, and the reason again is that the price is so high. I mean, why do they stand to make so much money that this is attractive? Only because of the laws. These things, I mean, they're just plants. They grow all over the place, you know, especially marijuana. There's no reason on earth that it should cost much of anything in terms of just, you know, the cost of producing the product. And under a normal system of competition in which everyone could grow it and, any, and anybody who tried to sell it for a high price would be uh, running the risk of having a competitor move in on his business very quickly, it simply, you know, it would have to have a very low price. Uh, yes, sir. Heroin isn't legal anywhere anymore. It, uh, most, a lot of these drugs were legal in other parts of the world for many years, but the United States has taken care of that. It has made uh, drug prohibitions of the U.S. type uh, a precondition of certain aspects of its foreign aid in many parts of the world and has uh, bullied other nations into imitating its laws. What you may be hearing about is what's going on in Holland, uh, in Amsterdam in particular. Uh, all the drug laws are still on the books, including the laws against marijuana, but there are clubs in the city of Amsterdam in which marijuana is just sold openly and the police just, I mean, in effect, 
the laws are just literally a dead letter. They're not being enforced. They are on the books. Amsterdam is still a signatory of the United Nations Single Convention on Narcotics Abuse, which binds it to stamp out marijuana and other dangerous drugs within its borders. But it isn't doing this at all with marijuana, and there are certain places in Amsterdam where I read that you can also freely buy heroin and nothing is done about it, although it's not sold openly at stands in the way that marijuana is. And the prices are therefore low. And as far as I have seen the assertion that there is uh, heroin-related crime in Holland, but I don't know what to make of this because it doesn't jibe with what I generally know to be the case, and I haven't seen enough detail to know on what basis that kind of claim is being made. I'm sorry. On high on what? <laughs> oh, sure. If you couldn't, I wouldn't be able to get anywhere, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, it feels different, and uh, just as it, I mean, have you ever driven when you were drunk? Like, I just wanted to do studies. Studies, yeah, there are studies, and uh, the studies show that reaction time is slowed down in certain cases. There have been a couple of studies which have been more or less suppressed because in, the, in their conclusions, the people who wrote the studies pointed out that they found that uh, drivers who were in the habit of smoking and driving tended to have fewer accidents, actually, when they were high than when on, on the average than when they weren't. And the reason that was proposed was, and everybody who has much to do with potheads will recognize this, is that they become paranoid about attracting attention to themselves or doing something wrong and therefore drive very slowly and very carefully. They overcompensate for the effects of the drugs. This is a common observation just among people who use the stuff. And uh, it uh, has even turned up, as I say, in a couple of the studies. Um, but uh, by and large, again, I mean, this is in the general category of the observation I made before. Nobody's been able to come up with a study that shows that marijuana is nearly as harmful as alcohol in affecting the aspects of one's well-being that affect one's ability to drive. Well, there would still be some crime uh, as long as the as the price was anything higher, I suppose, than you know, the uh, the price. We even have a certain amount of trivial crime in certain parts of the United States with things like tobacco. Uh, people smuggle cigarettes uh, into and out of places like Virginia and North Carolina because there are differences in state taxes, which can create, if you get a large enough shipment of cigarettes, a diff you know a sufficient difference that it provides an incentive to crime. Uh, hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, okay, let me uh, retrace my steps here. Uh, Okay, to, to sum up what I've said so far then, the basic rationale for the drugs, for the drug laws that we have is that the drugs are harmful. It seems to me that even judging our laws by the standards implied by that analysis, if we come into it and say, okay, I won't quibble with you about this, the drugs are harmful, just as harmful as you say they are, is the policy an effective one? No. Even judged by the standards of those who advocate the policy, the policy is not only ineffective at achieving what it is supposed to achieve, it is counterproductive. It actually exacerbates the problems that it is supposed to solve. If we, we have the policy so that we won't have crime caused by drug use, the policy creates more crime than would exist if it weren't there, if we only had the drug use there. We want to safeguard public health and make sure that people's bodies and minds aren't destroyed by drug use. The policy causes more minds and bodies to be destroyed by drug use through impurities and high prices than would be destroyed by it if the drugs were simply freely available and there was no policy. There is literally no way to justify what we are doing in our drug policy, even by the standards of those who want the policy to be there. It is a failure and worse than a failure. Now, of course, judged by <coughs> libertarian standards, it's even worse than that. Not only because we don't accept, presumably, 
the goals that it has. We think these are none of the government's business. People, if the, even if the drugs are harmful, people have a, they have a right to destroy themselves, to commit suicide slowly or rapidly as they prefer. If, uh, if the drugs lead people to commit crimes, the fact that somebody has taken a drug does not mean he's responsible, not responsible for his behavior. He's responsible for the committing the crime, whatever he had in his body, whether it was salt or sugar or milk or heroin at the time that he committed it. This is not a special problem from the libertarian point of view. Our policy from a libertarian point of view creates all kinds of other difficulties for us. We hear about a lot about the exclusionary rule, for example. Now, the exclusionary rule and the whole issue of search and seizure law, Fourth Amendment law, is, is all tied up in victimless crimes. If you go into a law textbook and look at the cases that established the exclusionary rule in the first place, you find that they're all victimless crimes cases, cases like Mapp versus Ohio, which was a pornography case. <clears throat> the cases that, the, it's, it's upwards of 90% of all the cases in the federal courts in which evidence is thrown out for illegal search and seizure are uh, victimless crimes cases in the gambling, pornography, and drugs categories. The main reason that police exceed constitutional guidelines in conducting searches is because there is no other way for them to enforce laws against victimless crimes. The people who are committing a drug crime, they're just sitting in somebody's living room, you know, and one of them hands the other one a package and the other one hands the other one some money. And they both agree to the transaction and no one complains. So how are the police even going to find out that this is happening? Unless they are spying in the window or tapping the telephone line or, you know, uh, knocking down the door without a search warrant or any uh, grounds for suspicion that anything is happening or doing something else which can ultimately, under exclusionary rule law, get the case thrown out. This, this, the, the, in, in some ways, actually, I would say that we hardly would need those kinds of protections if we didn't have victimless uh, crime laws of different sorts on the books. So, and you can, you can look at the development <coughs> of Fourth Amendment law. It starts in the 20s with prohibition. It was during the 20s that you first suddenly start having all these cases in which uh, lawyers are going in arguing that the Fourth Amendment rights of the defendants were violated. And the reason is because the only way to enforce prohibition was for the prohibition agents to do, just as I said. And so one of the, one of the significant features of our constitutional protections in this country has been eroded, and it has been eroded specifically by our drug policy. This is a consequence that libertarians would presumably deplore that is an additional evil consequence of the drug policy that we have in effect right now. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, it has had uh, deleterious consequences also for our foreign policy. It, has made, uh, the, it is one of the factors that has made the United States extremely unpopular with a lot of people in Latin America, especially in those parts of Latin America in which co the coca plant has grown, because traditionally the, those, the coca plant has not been against the law. The Indians have been chewing the coca leaves for centuries, as I say. And um, in fact, in uh, Peru and Bolivia still, the governments of those countries are in the cocaine trade. And part of this is not just because they're a bunch of uh, generals who are uh, looking only for the money, it's because in that country, in those countries, despite decades and decades of U.S. pressure otherwise, people have never got to the point that they think of cocaine as something evil. You know, they think of it the way we think of booze. It's just, you know, so you snort cocaine or you chew the leaves or you something like that. It's just not, they haven't been willing to accept the American uh, vision of this stuff. Yet, despite how uh, totally indefensible our drug policy is by any existing standards, ours or anybody else's, it is one of the most popular policies that we have. Uh, if, a, if a politician wants a policy to, uh, to get, you know, get up on a, on a platform and uh, announce his fervent enthusiasm for, and he doesn't want to have to worry about offending anybody, drugs. We won't offend anybody at all. Right now, across the bay, Lionel Wilson is staging an enormous publicity stunt on behalf of his third uh, campaign for the uh, Merrill's office in the Merrill office in Oakland. You know the the, uh, the drug crisis in Oakland. Well, the drug crisis in Oakland isn't any different today from the way it was five years ago or ten years ago. It's the same thing. It, all that has happened is that you know here, here's a politician. He comes up and he says, "Oh, the drug crisis. We have to have a war on drugs in Oakland." Now he puts himself in an enviable position right away, because no one will argue with him. Nobody's going to stand up there and say, "Oh, it's all bullshit. The drugs are not harmful. The uh, laws are harmful. Instead, we should get rid of them." Wilson Riles Jr. can't say that. He's Wilson's opponent, so he has to. He's placed in, a, in, a, in the position of having to say, "Well, yes, I agree with Mayor Wilson," and uh, he's uh, auto he's automatically 
in, placed in a secondary position. He did not have the fortitude to come forth in the beginning and uh, crusade against this horrible problem, and uh, instead somebody beat him to the jump. Nancy Reagan wants to improve her image, you know? People think she spends too much on China and on clothes and so forth. Well, she gets into drug abuse. And it's, it's one of the most popular kinds of things for first ladies and other useless types in uh, the political world to get into because no one questions it. Uh, it's what the uh, broadcast stations want for their public service announcements. Everybody is against drug abuse. I have here from Harper's Magazine, October of last year, 1984, they uh, delved into the bulletin of the Department of Justice's Bureau of Justice Statistics. 60,000 Americans were asked to rank the seriousness of 204 different crimes. Based on their responses, a severity index was arrived at for each crime, and then they list the 20 most serious and most heinous crimes that anyone might commit. Number 10 is running a narcotics ring. Let me list for you the 10 crimes, the, the next 10 crimes that it outranks in seriousness in the public mind. Number 11, a person plants a bomb in a public building. The bomb explodes and one person is injured, but no medical treatment is required. Number 12, an armed person hijacks an airline and holds the crew and passengers hostage until a ransom is paid. Number 13, a person plants a bomb in a public building, the bomb explodes, and 20 people are injured, but no medical treatment is required. Number 14, a man rapes a woman. Because of her physical injuries, she must be hospitalized. Number 15, a woman stabs her husband. As a result, he dies. Number 16, an armed person hijacks an airplane and demands to be flown to another country. Number 17, a man rapes a woman. No other physical injury occurs. Number 18, a man tries to entice a minor into his car for immoral purposes. Number 19, a, a person intentionally sets fire to a building, causing $100,000 worth of damage. Number 20, a person intentionally shoots a victim with a gun. The victim requires hospitalization. All of these crimes are less serious than selling drugs to somebody who wants to buy them from you. It, just the other day in the San Francisco Chronicle, there's a story on the front page. Governor Duke Majin is demanding more funds to combat child abuse, armed robbery, and marijuana growers. I looked at that, and to me, this is hysterically funny. There's three people, child abusers, armed robbers, and people who grow a plant. <laughs> this is the way the public perceives this issue. Now, why does the public perceive it this way? I think part of it is the media. As I have said, sort of getting ahead of myself several times in the course of standing up here, the media, they think they just they don't want to even consider that there's any questions to be asked on the conventional wisdom on drugs. And if anything, I work in the media, this is how I make my living, if anything, it seems to me it's gotten worse. This is one of the reasons that I, that I have the, for this pessimism that I said was gripping me when I first stood up here. Uh, in the, since about 1979, what's that, six years ago now, uh, if anything, the people in the media, many of them are drug users themselves. And then they go on the air or write in the newspaper and they just hand out this pablum that they get from the Drug Enforcement Administration's uh, news releases as though there's, there's nothing wrong with it and it's a reflection of the truth. And um, back in the 70s, some groups arose. Normal was probably the biggest one, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. It grew with Hugh Hefner's money to a substantial size and it had a lot of influence in that statement that I referred to that President Carter made calling for decriminalization of marijuana was written for him by Keith Strop, the uh, founder of Normal. Normal today is in a shambles. It's closed down its regional offices. Its California office, which was the last of its regional offices to uh, continue to exist, has now been closed down. The national office has maybe half the budget that it used to have. It no longer has any contact with the uh, inner uh, echelons of the federal government. No ends with the administration or anything of the kind. Um, it has, uh, its, its efforts have uh, fallen off completely. Uh, you read more in these days in the newspapers about parents groups in Georgia uh, fighting uh, the sale of bongs to their children and uh, roach clips and things of this kind than you ever see anything about normal doing anything. Uh, the issue is regarded by a lot of people who do understand the truth on it as relatively unimportant. Now, this is true, I think, especially among libertarians. Libertarians have the right idea on this. I have found some resistance among some older libertarians, especially, to my kind of analysis that the drugs aren't really harmful. They don't either they don't want to believe it 
or if they don't, if they do believe it, they think it would be hard to sell to people. So why don't we just, you know, push that aside and say even if they are harmful on grounds of individual rights, people have a right to use these drugs, which of course is true. So libertarians have the right idea on the on the question, but look around yourselves. You know, it's going to be one of the biggest problems trying to sell this to the general public. You start looking at it in the way that someone in the Libertarian Party does, not just as in terms of the correctness of the position and the beneficial consequences of adopting it, but how can I persuade people of the wisdom of this course? It's one of the worst tasks to try to undertake is to persuade them of the wisdom of the course of getting rid of drug laws. It's like a religious obsession, which the media is constantly hammering over and over, day in and day out, the people are being told about the menace of drugs. They hardly ever hear anything on the contrary. You got a real uphill struggle trying to sell them on something like this. And is it that important? Of course it's important. People's rights are being violated. People are being thrown in jail. There are some, you know, outstanding cases of some kid sells a cop a joint and goes to prison for 16 years or something like this that are outrageous violations of individual rights. On the other hand, not as many people are, are as affected by it as are affected by the welfare system, as are affected by the selective service, especially in the event of another war taking place down in Central America. There are all sorts of larger issues that looked at from a purely pragmatic point of view as a libertarian, you have to say, are more important. They would be an easier sell they will do more good more quickly if we can actually turn public policy around on these issues. So there's a natural tendency to say, well, you know, people are irrational on this topic. You can't deal with them. So we won't put a lot of emphasis on it. And a lot of emphasis is not put on it. And I can't, I can't be too critical of this. It makes sense to me. If I were in a strategic sort of position in the party and trying to choose issues with an eye to how we can have the most effect on the general public, I too would be inclined to say, Let's not put a lot of resources into uh, drug reform because we can use our resources better in another way. We aren't so rich that we can afford to do this. So how can there be hope? <laughs> I really, you know, I, I'm supposed to be writing a book on this subject for the Cato Institute, and I have been supposed to be writing it for some time. And as perhaps you can tell, I've done a little reading and I know something about it, but I'm having trouble doing the actual writing, and part of the reason is that the more I read and the more I learn, the more I realize that all of this has been known. Everything I've told you today, is none of, none of this is new. A couple of decades people have been writing this kind of thing. Many, many books have come out and articles in magazines and journals. It's well known, all of it, and has been for decades to anybody who goes, into the, goes to the trouble to study the topic. And what has happened? The general public still doesn't know it. The media still doesn't know it. The people in the government still don't know it. Can anything, you know, what, what am I writing this book for? Just to get money from the Cato Institute? That's what I find myself thinking. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, sir. You're right in saying that all this stuff has been well known, especially among law enforcement agencies who have seminars on drug use uh, and the effects. But uh, I don't think it's of interest to people unless you put it into a context of who benefits and who suffers and the hypocrisy and all the things. And unless you write the book with that kind of a focus and context, I don't think there's a market for it, just that nobody bothers to read the stuff that's already been published, including that book you have there, which Consumers Reports distributed mm -hmm. at a very moderate price 10 years ago. About that. Almost 20 now. <laughs> okay. uh, <clears throat> I mean, you can write a similar book to that, and you'll get nowhere because it's fact. And it's fact. <laughs> And it's not in context. It's not. In, I was up in Mendocino last week and talking to people about the drug traffic there and some of the effects, the pros and cons, of who is benefiting, and so forth. And it's a fascinating subject, and the newspapers have run a few articles on that. But take it in a broader scope, and not just Mendocino, but the whole United States, the extent of drug use and the who benefits from it, including possibly the CIA, is not inconceivable because that's happened in Southeast Asia, 
drug traffic is being run by the military. Uh, unless you put it in that context, I don't think you have to deal with the problem. Damn. Well, I find myself suspicious of uh, the question a little bit because uh, I haven't ever encountered this. Uh, and uh, increasingly, I'm inclined to think that people who do um, exhibit zombie-like behavior at the age of 30 after a number of years of using drugs, uh, that we may be barking up the wrong tree if we think it's because they were using drugs. That rather they might have been using drugs for the same reason that they are now looking like zombies. Uh, that uh, they have uh, certain kinds of psychological problems, or as Thomas Zaz would call them, problems in living, that uh, make them want to escape from uh, just normal awareness in whatever pleasant way they can, and so they take a lot of drugs, but that in itself is not necessarily what's causing the uh, uh, zombie-like behavior. And, the, and uh, part of the reason that I, <clears throat> that I feel this way is because nobody's ever, you know, there isn't any evidence that drugs harm the mind. Uh, or anything else, as I pointed out. Uh, on the other hand, Jack Schaefer, whom I mentioned earlier in connection with uh, the designer drugs concept, uh, made a point of arguing once in an LR article on uh, PCP that he wrote that with regard to PCP and other cases as well, one of the consequences <coughs> of uh, <coughs> government uh, pro drug prohibitions is first of all, there are certain people who are attracted to drugs in effect because they are prohibited. Uh, this is one of the, the factors that people sometimes forget when they talk about, well, how many huge numbers of people would we have out there taking drugs if there were no laws against them? In some cases, they might not be any larger than they are now because a lot of the people try these drugs mainly because they're not supposed to. If they were, as coffee is, for example, in our society, and a lot of people used it and a lot of people don't, and uh, it's up to you, a great many people would not be attracted to it in the first place. And on the other hand, if it were freely available, there would be accurate information available about the uh, contents of the drugs. There would be an economic incentive for private companies as well as the government to do tests on what kinds of consequences might befall an individual who took it in what quantities or in combination with what other things. There would be all sorts of information available uh, that isn't. So that uh, the government prohibition, which is supposedly intended to protect people from the evil consequences of the drug, may actually, on the one hand, serve as an advertisement for the drug and get them to try it in the first place and then set things up in such a way that they're denied the information that they would n normally have access to uh, to tell them why they might not want to take it. I don't know if that exactly answers you, but that's uh, my reaction. Yes, sir. This is the uh, designer drugs concept or another aspect of it that's in uh, Jack Schaefer's article in Science 85. Uh, it's possible to make chemical analogs which are slightly different from the uh, formula that's listed in the uh, federal schedules so that until they get around to adding it to the schedule, it's legal. And it takes a certain amount of time because of the bureaucracy to get something scheduled so that even though the Reagan administration has now given emergency scheduling authority to the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration so that it can do it in about 30 days, still, you know, in 30 days you can come up with something else. And uh, there are you know, thousands of, of close analogs of many of these uh, drugs so that it would be theoretically almost impossible for the government to keep up with it. And Jack contends that, uh, and he did a cover article in Inquiry on this topic too, that the, the war on drugs is lost. It can't be won because now that we have this synthetic uh, capability, uh, it's uh, impossible for the government to keep up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd actually be worried about the passing of the law on that, like uh, they have already in the drug regulation FDA. I mean, it's illegal to market any new drug unless FDA approves it. And if we're not careful, we're going to get to the same point. All, you know, with, with, with DEA type drugs as well. I mean, 
Yes, sir. Certainly a uh, something to look forward to, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> But the fact that the Chronicle put it that way it suggests that, you know, most people don't, they don't, doesn't even make them do a double take. It just fits right in, you know, armed robbers, child molesters, and marijuana growers. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, one of the funnier things I've seen recently is I was going to the post office about a week ago and they had, I can't remember his name, that Democrat was running independently. What's his name? For the 84 election. Oh, um. Uh, yeah, Lyndon LaRouche. And I picked up one of their newsletters and their big thing with the drugs is that it's a big plot by the IMF and the World Bank. And the reason that the well, actually, there could be something to that because, uh, especially, you know, country. I, I made the cracks about Jamaica earlier. My portrait of Jamaica is similar to uh, what you could say about Peru and Bolivia. It's not as true about Colombia. It's a somewhat more advanced nation. But a lot of the nations which have, uh, which are big producers of drugs or the plant precursors of them. Uh, have no other viable economy, and there are enormous profits to be made thanks to these laws. So obviously they are strongly attracted to that. I, I saw just the other day, I read news on the weekends at a radio station, and uh, Saturday morning I had a story that President Reagan said that the uh, uh, Sandinistas and uh, other Soviet uh, sympathizers in Central America are uh, involved in the drug traffic in order to destroy the minds of American youth so that it will be easier for the Soviet Union to take them over. So it isn't only obvious nuts like Lyndon LaRouche who think along these lines, but uh, you know, I think Ronald Reagan is an obvious nut too, but obviously a great many people disagree with me about this. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I, saw, I, I wrote some notes earlier, and I was going to use Timothy Leary as an example of a productive person who used drugs, but then I realized that even among libertarians, I couldn't necessarily count on people uh, not thinking that that was a tongue-in-cheek example. I'm inclined to agree with you, but I've run into a lot of people who would say that Timothy Leary is an example of a great mind destroyed by drugs, you know. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> Doesn't surprise me. Yeah. How would you, uh, or do you know anything about uh, how the demise of normal occurred? Who was it? Was it the other part of the Well, there was, this, there was a book called um, High in America, uh, and it had a subtitle, something like The Story of Normal uh, and its attempt to reform the marijuana laws or something by Pat Anderson, which came out in 1981, as I recall, early. And that's the extent of my knowledge. That plus conversations with Gordon Brownell, who used to be a San Francisco lawyer, who used to be the head of the um, West Coast Office of Normal, and briefly for about a year was also head of National Normal toward the end. Uh, and he basically verifies the book, which is that um, Keith Strop and several of the other people who were running the organization had always had a certain number of contacts with the Yippies. Uh, the Yippies were uh, one of the uh, best factions during the 60s uh, from the standpoint of having a rational attitude toward drugs. And uh, one of the uh, Yippies, a guy named Tom Forsad, who founded High Times Magazine, was, uh, along with Hugh Hefner, an early heavy contributor to Normal. And um, I can't recall the exact details as I stand up here, not having looked at the book, not anticipating this question, but. Uh, Basically what happened is that Normal had a conference in 1979, late or early 1980 in Washington. They used to have an annual conference which was partly scientific, partly legal in its emphasis. And they uh, had got to the point that their conferences were attended by, uh, admitted by people in the government and they had uh, DEA people and uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse people and National Institute on Mental Health people who agreed to come and speak and, and be on panels because they had got themselves to the point that the opposition regarded them as serious, respectable people and not a bunch of kooks. And uh, this was one of their great achievements, I think. I mean, that's a huge public relations coup to have done that in less than 10 years. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> uh, the yippie element uh, convinced Keith Strop to agree to funding a pie hit on, uh, I'm trying to remember, I, I can't remember the official's name, but he was an official with the National Institute on Drug Abuse who had done a turnaround a few days before the conference and made public statements about the uh, dangers of marijuana, which conflicted with his earlier statements on the same subject, and uh, which were felt as a sort of a personal betrayal by people in normal. Uh, this rem I find myself thinking of Robert DuPont, who's now the head of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, of whom what I just said is also true, but it wasn't DuPont himself, it was a lower ranking official, uh, was up there on the platform at the table, and uh, Aaron Kay, who's a, um, uh, among people who know the Yippies, well-known Yippie pie hitter, uh, came rushing in with a cream pie and uh, smacked the guy in the face with it, and uh, after that seemingly trivial incident was all over with normal. None of the people in the government uh, would have anything to do with them anymore, and uh, once their uh, obvious influence stopped, then you know funding started becoming a problem. Uh, when I was uh, closest to the organization myself in the late 70s, when Gordon was running it for a year as an interim national director, uh, they were already in a situation in which Hugh Hefner had, was saying to them, look, I've been putting up most of the bucks for your organization now for almost 10 years, and uh, I want you to show that you have uh, widespread appeal and uh, constituency by being able to raise a larger percentage of your budget. And this was happening at just the point that the, you know, their, their influence in Washington was going down the tubes. They could no longer take uh, prospective donors to functions that they held in Washington and say, you see the, all the people from uh, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare are here, and the people from National Institute on Mental Health, and uh, we have friends in high places, and we're really going to be effective, because it wasn't happening anymore. It does seem kind of amazing, you know. <clears throat> it's almost like it was just a pretext. If this is the true story, and this is all that there is to be said, it's like the government was looking for an excuse to uh, stop this, and uh, <clears throat> so the pie gave them an excuse. Is there any soft spot anywhere in the government today uh, where there are some reformist uh, opinions? 
I don't know of any. It used to be that uh, there were people in places like NIMH and NIDA that uh, took reasonable or semi-reasonable uh, approaches. But over the last few years, the reports that I get, I know some people around the country, lawyers and doctors, who are interested in this and are academics and uh, want to do scholarly work on the effects of drugs. And uh, they tell me that it is literally, it's no longer possible to get any funding unless it is obvious from your past publications and your credentials that you can be expected to do a study which shows how harmful the drugs are and how uh, beneficial our laws are. Part of their three-part series. Yeah, yeah four. Yet, you know, there, there are signs that the sales of especially marijuana and cocaine are constantly escalating. Now, this is one of the anomalies to me. This, uh, you, you gather from the paper, even though you have to assume every, with the DEA and therefore with the press, every drug bust is the biggest ever. Have you ever noticed this? Every one. It's just they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. To some extent, you have to discount this. But there is evidence that the sales and the value of the products is steadily growing. Who are these users? I see, uh, I see s surveys that are done that show that marijuana use is declining. This was brought into my mind by what you just said in certain age groups such as uh, children and so forth. Well, if this is true, who is smoking all this marijuana? Who is snorting all this cocaine? Isn't it? I have always assumed that it was people who were the 60s generation and a little before and a little after who are now, you know, in their anywhere from late 20s to early 40s and uh, are uh, young, young people or early middle-aged people. Uh, but, and these, these people presumably, according to my understanding of the way the world works, because they are now in their 30s and early 40s, ought to be coming into just the beginnings of coming into being the politically the most powerful group. They're large, the baby boom generation is so large, it forms such a huge segment of society. This group of people presumably understand about drugs. You shouldn't be able to tell these people that marijuana rots the brain and expect them to believe you. They know better if they don't use it themselves, and 25 million Americans are supposed to be users of it. Uh, they know somebody who does, lots of people who do. But yet, where is, the, where is there evidence of public opinion being in conflict with the, with the current uh, in the newly fashionable uh, uh, war on drugs all over again. It, it doesn't look to me as though public opinion is necessarily inflamed in support of it, but it just seems very apathetic. And I would think that all these uh, yuppies who used to be hippies w and who are supposed to be self-interested in so many ways would be more interested in this because why should they pay $100 a gram for their cocaine when they could be getting it a lot cheaper? You know, it's... <laughs>